Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the end of the book of Joshua. Now Joshua has led the Israelites across the river into the, and, and they have occupied the promised land. Joshua has divided the land up between the tribes. And here at the end of the book of Joshua, they renew the covenant with God. And in our passage this morning, which is Joshua 24, 14, and 15, Joshua asked the people to choose which God they'll serve. Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. May God add blessing to the reading and the hearing of this scripture. You're invited to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading is from Matthew. We've recently had readings from the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And in those chapters, we saw Jesus' ministry and teaching. And here in these chapters immediately after that, in chapters 8 and 9, we see Jesus' ministry in action. Uh, these chapters contain stories of miracles and healings. And our reading today is from chapter 9, verses 2 through 8, and Jesus heals a paralytic. And just then some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus perceived their thoughts and said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God who had given such authority to human beings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we consider what it is that God's vision is for us, I will tell you that I often, as well as other preachers, will search for God's vision in terms of doing sermon series and, and what kind of creative sermon series that we can come up with, what kind of snappy title that in, in these days and times won't just maybe uh, interest people that already know and love us and will kind of give us grace if it's really not that exciting, but with people who are just scrolling through uh, the internet and, and we want to find something that will grab their attention. And, and so I, I, I will tell you that I, I rest I wrestled and I rolled and I wrestled, I rolled, and I kept coming up with doing a sermon series on gratitude. And frankly, that's not very unique or intriguing, especially in the month of November leading up to Thanksgiving. I mean, it's redundant, if you will. And so I kept trying to change it to something else, and it just kept coming back to me. And, and, and I remembered very often, uh, we preachers preach what we most need to hear, <laughs> And maybe not unlike me, for you, gratitude is a, a little more complex this year than it has been. Maybe, maybe as I entered November last year and the year before and, and every other year uh, for 57, I never wondered about what it meant to, to be grateful or, or, or to have a, th a great Thanksgiving. It always just seemed like something that we could do by default. But this year, this year, thinking about being grateful as we go through the series today, grateful for the past, next week, grateful for the future, and, and Thanksgiving week, grateful for the present, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable. And I keep hearing those words ring in my heart from, uh, from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi that we spent October in. And, and those last words that he says uh, in that last chapter, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And, and I think to myself, you know, there are a lot more days right now that I am not like Paul than I am. And that probably surprises him less than it does me. But maybe you resemble that remark as well. 
But I finally realized I, I couldn't kind of get out of this, uh, this need to do this series on gratitude. And so I, I wrote this sermon while I was away uh, for a few days and, and was quite proud of myself. And, and when, I'm, when I'm typing a sermon on my laptop and I'm not here where the system is, I use a thumb drive. And, and this will just kind of tell you God's humor with me. So I, I used the thumb drive and I saved my blog and my sermon for this week and was quite proud of myself that I got them done so early. And, and when I came home uh, from having been outside where I took my laptop, because you can take your laptop anywhere, I forgot that I put the thumb drive that I had saved my sermon and my blog on in the pocket of my jeans. And I was so proud of myself that I did laundry the next day. I did laundry the next day. And I didn't check my pockets. And so when I'm moving the laundry that has been washed and spun and beaten around on inside the washing machine with soap, I move all the laundry into the dryer and I look back into the laundry drum or bin or whatever it's called and there's the thumb drive. And I thought, 2020, you cannot be over fast enough for me. And I'm thinking, why, why didn't, I, I, I have my sermon in my head, but I mean, can I remember exactly what I wrote? What am I going to do? And I thought about taking my blow dryer to it, and then I thought, Nanette, no, really, it's already gone through enough. Just leave it alone. But do you know what? Here's the good news of that story. I popped that thumb drive into my computer two days after it had been washed, and everything is still there, and it came up. I still want 2020 to end, and I still am not sure gratitude is the way I want to go. But friends, I went from being certain that I was not grateful to being certain I was grateful. And that is the challenge, isn't it? It's a roller coaster ride that we're on. Where in one minute we can be ecstatic, and the next minute our bellies can be scraping the ground. And that's really the question of faith, isn't it? What, what keeps us going when it's not easy? What keeps us going when it's not fun? What keeps us going when gratitude is hard to find? When, 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 when elections cause cities to board up their windows downtown for fear of violence? When virus numbers are going up and not down? I, I sat in a waiting room uh, when I had a, a few days off and and had an appointment and I'm sitting there and everybody was nice and safely distanced and everybody had a mask but there was a person who was sitting a couple of chairs away from me who lowered their mask beneath their nose. And I thought, what part of breathing in and out um, is hard? Understanding that your mask needs to cover all of that. And because we were in a medical area, I thought, you know, there's probably some vulnerable people here. And I... I Maybe like you, I wasn't sure what I should say, if I should say anything, but then the, the nice receptionist behind the glass and the plexiglass and the bulletproof glass and all of that, she just says in general, kind of spontaneously, um, everyone, if you could just remember uh, to wear your masks and please place it over both your nose and your mouth. So we all looked around the rest of us and she didn't. I'm supposed to be grateful and not a little bit annoyed all the time. I'm supposed to be grateful and, and, and looking around for blessings. I'm supposed to be grateful. I'm your pastor. You should expect me to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known. The Lord is near. That's what Paul says. But that's not the scripture for today, so I don't have to worry about that, right? Maybe I... Maybe I do. Maybe, maybe this year is the challenge for us. Maybe it's a challenge in a way that our faith hasn't been challenged, if ever, in a long time. Joshua, this is Joshua's farewell discourse. If you'll remember with me, Joshua is who Moses blessed to lead the people uh, when Moses was done. And, and next week we'll look at Moses and the moments that God had with Moses before Moses was swept up into God's full presence. 
And, and it's Joshua who leads the people into this land of promise. And so in this 24th chapter, in this final discourse, Joshua reminds the people very specifically, almost in a step-by-step -step basis, this is what God has done for you all along the way. And he recalls for them Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and how God fulfilled God's promise to them to, uh, to, to make them multiply and, and, and to... And to bless them so that they would be a blessing to all the peoples of, of the earth. And how God led them towards this promised land. And, and, and when the people were taken into slavery, how God uh, lifted up Moses. And, and Moses became that voice and, and led them through the wilderness up to the point of this land of promise. And then Joshua had been with them and led them into this place of promise. And, and Joshua says, now it's time, friends. You, you have to decide. You have to decide who you're going to serve. Is that a rhetorical question? Joshua's just been through the history of everything God has done for them. And now Joshua looks at them and says, uh, choose this day whom you will serve. And then he answers the question. He says, he says, now therefore, revere the Lord and serve the Lord with sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. But then the next verse. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. The gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land in, with whom you now live but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Oh, finally, we got to that verse. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I've seen that printed on, on country chic barn wood, proudly displayed on someone's wall. I remember it in Gladys Collop's kitchen. Gladys and Ivan lived only about a, a mile and a quarter from where we were, and that's a short distance in the country where I came from and... And Gladys had it on a trivet, a wrought iron trivet hanging on her wall. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wonder why the rest of that quote wasn't on there. I wonder why the rest of the quote about putting away the gods of your ancestors who served them beyond the, the river in Egypt or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. We don't, we want, we don't want to think about the other gods that might get in our way of serving the Lord in sincerity. Interestingly enough, Joshua says, in sincerity and faithfulness. Choose this day whom you will serve. We want to serve the Lord, I believe that. But, but wanting to serve the Lord means we need to know the Lord. <laughs> how, do we, how do we know the Lord? Well, God chose to come in human form. It's that sort of vicarious tree that looks a whole lot like Christmas that Stacy and Grace are decorating for Thanksgiving in gratitude. We, we know the Lord because we believe that God came in human form and the one we know is Jesus. So it, it means we need to know Jesus and we need to know what Jesus is about. And as Sean referenced, we went through those, that Sermon on the Mount, the, the, the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of Matthew. And if you want to, to reveal or see revealed the character of this Jesus, we say we want to choose to serve. We look at those three chapters. And we decide whether or not that's the Lord we want to serve. The scribes aren't sure this morning. They're not sure about Jesus. Maybe, maybe we aren't either. I, I fasted from social media from dawn to dusk while I was away for a few days. But one of the things I did was to, was to look at sermons because everybody's are online now. And so I, I listened to some colleagues' sermons that were magnificent, and, and I, was, I was checking out people from across the country, and, and, and I came across a, a sermon by the Reverend Dr. Stephen Cady, who, interestingly enough, is originally from Olathe and is now serving, uh, I, I believe, um, at, at Asbury United Methodist in New Jersey. And his sermon last Sunday 
before the election was called the once and future king. That sermon title caught my attention. Christ the King Sunday is, is right before the first Sunday of Advent. Christ the King Sunday is the same Sunday that we celebrate Thanksgiving. And I thought, well, did Dr. Katie not understand uh, that, that Christ the King Sunday is, is later? But, but he did understand. And he talked about how hard that sermon was to give right before the election. And he started by saying how hard it is sometimes to be a Christian because of Jesus and how Jesus is and how Jesus chooses to relate to the world. So that if we say that we are going to follow Jesus as a once and future king above all other authorities, we sort of need to be careful because of what that following means and how we treat one another. That's really what Joshua is saying to the people this morning. He's saying, look, because had I had, had I had Sean read further than that, the people say, right after he says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The people say, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua says, no, you won't. You can't serve the Lord because you're too interested in all these other gods. No, they say, we'll serve the Lord. And then he says, then, then let me tell you, your words will be a witness against you. Because our God is a jealous God and won't tolerate those who say they will serve and don't live that way. I want to I wanna be grateful for those words from Joshua because he's renewing the covenant that God established with Moses at the top of Mount Sinai. I want to be grateful that we have a God who is that strong and that powerful. I want to I be grateful for a God who makes very clear what God's expectations are. But it's hard for me to be grateful to that when I look at my life and I realize that there are too many times that I'm weak and not strong. Too many times that I say I choose to follow Jesus. But it's hard because we live in the reality of a, of a divided world. Oh, but, oh, but I say, here's, here's my saving grace. Here's my saving grace. It's Jesus. It, it's Jesus who's that saving grace. It's, it's Jesus who, who gets me past that, that, that law, that dot of every I and cross of every T that Paul says we can't follow because we're human and we're broken. So we just, we, we, need, we need to look at the life of Jesus. There's a young man named Caleb Isell who posted today, this morning, early this morning, that he doesn't want to be a Jesus follower as a reward to get to heaven. He doesn't want to be a Jesus follower as a way of getting out of the horrors of hell. He wants to be a Jesus follower because he is so compelled by the life of Jesus that he wants to embody it and, and he wants to learn it and he wants to know it and most especially he wants to live it. Choose this day, Joshua says, choose this day who you will serve. As Pastor Cheryl referred in, in her prayer, we're divided, some are celebrating, some are mourning. Some are filled with fear, some are filled with hope. And we're all in this together, but we haven't quite, we haven't quite received that as a gift. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will, will we serve the God of, uh, of joy-filled hearts even when Paul is sitting in prison? Will, will our faith be that strong in moments when we feel most afraid? Will we rejoice? Will we be filled with gratefulness when the washing machine takes a thumb drive and slams it around, but then it works? What if it hadn't? Do I only rejoice when I, when I feel like things are working out the way I need them to? Can we be thankful that we're given the choice? Why didn't God just mandate for us all to believe the same way, the same thing all the time? Choose this day, Joshua says, choose this day. Do I choose to know this Jesus? 
As Sean says, Jesus chooses to live out this ministry in the chapters following the Sermon on the Mount in this particular story. By the way, this is a story that, that Mark and Luke also have. Theirs differ from Matthew's in that they, the, that's the story where they lower the paralytic on a mat through the roof of the house. Matthew simply has the disciples or the friends bringing the paralytic before Jesus and the crowds are so thick that, that it's hard to get through. And, and I don't know if you noticed as Sean read that scripture, it says when Jesus saw their faith. Not the faith of the paralytic. When Jesus saw their faith. He was so moved that he says, son, don't underestimate the power of his claiming this man as a family member, not biologically, as a family member in the faith. Others would have thought the paralytic had sinned or his parents had sinned and that's why he had this disability. So for Jesus to call him son is a radical statement in and of itself and for Jesus not to answer his request but to see, to witness the faith of his friends who bring him, who lift him up literally to bring him to Jesus. When Jesus sees their faith, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Wait, what? Just give him legs that work again. Don't mess around with sins. We don't want to hear about sins. We don't want to hear about forgiveness. We're not sure we want to know about grace unless it's grace the way we want to define it. That's, see, that's what happens. The scribes in their thoughts, they say, he's blaspheming the name of God. Who is he that he thinks he can forgive sins? As if that's the man's real problem. And not his paralysis? Are we not paralyzed by our sin? If we're not, it's probably because we're unwilling to reflect and recognize it. I'm challenging us to have gratitude for the past today. Not just gratitude for the past that we have given to us in the, this living book of God's word, I, I'm going to ask and challenge us to have gratitude for the past in our own lives. Do we claim those moments when we aren't at our best? Do we claim those moments when we're broken? Do we claim those moments when we make bad decisions? Or, or do we just deny them? Because we're afraid we can't move through them and past them. Jesus sees the faith of these friends who have lifted this man up and brought him to Jesus. And Jesus evidently believes that the way to, for Jesus to lift him up is to forgive his sins. Maybe you and I are both paralyzed this morning as well. Maybe we have sins that have gone unforgiven because we don't want to recognize them. We don't want to name them. We don't want to be, we don't want to be thankful that we have a God who sees us the way we really are. Joshua says, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Can we be sincere with God about who we are and about our fears that our sins will overcome us, that we get paralyzed and we don't want to name them? And the scribes don't want to hear about sins. They want to look at Jesus and say, he's blaspheming because God, only God has the authority to forgive sins. And Jesus somehow knows us. He somehow knows our human frailty and weakness. And it says he, he hears their thoughts and Jesus says, why do you have evil in your hearts? That caught me. Because sometimes I don't want good things for other people. I think that's the evil they have in their hearts. He's not worried about them calling him names. He's going to die for them. He's worried about what's in their hearts. They can't be joyful for this man whose friends had enough faith to bring him before Jesus and to receive the gift of forgiveness that Jesus can give that is the true freedom. They can't be happy about that. And Jesus says, why do you have evil in your hearts? But fine, so that you may know that I have the power to forgive sins. He looks at the guy and says, take up your mat and walk. Go home. 
And the guy does, and that's what we're left with. And we just, once again, slide past the need for sins to be forgiven. We slide past how hard it is sometimes to be a follower of Jesus because a follower of Jesus puts, it, puts us so many times at odds with the world because Jesus wasn't seeking wealth. He wasn't seeking fame. He wasn't seeking fortune. He was seeking to lift people up that the world was pushing to the outside. That the world was defining as sinful and therefore unacceptable. Are we willing to stand up even, even when our peers may, may reject us? To say in this moment, my faith in Jesus says this is how I am to treat this person. In this moment, I know this person is included. In this moment, I know that I'm not supposed to throw stones at my enemies, verbal or physical. <laughs> Are you grateful for your past that has brought you this far on the way? Even for those moments that you haven't been at your best, would you with me as, as a part of this journey of Thanksgiving this year, will you with me spend some time this week bringing to mind <laughs> those moments when we haven't been our best self so that we too can be healed so that we too can ask for forgiveness. Because friends, if we, if we will name that and allow ourselves to be healed and forgiven, you know what, gives us, you know what that gives us the power to do? Gives us the power to forgive. And right now, friends, this nation needs a whole lot of forgiving power. And that doesn't have to do with political persuasion. It has to do with humanity. We all need to forgive and we all need to be forgiven. That's not up for debate. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. That first hymn that I call the song of my people. But I am friends. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted us. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Amen.